Welcome class to week six. Um, I'll be getting back your midterm grades as soon as possible and uh, today we'll be talking about social justice both in terms of politics and economics. Um, so we'll start by considering whether democracy is a justifiable or, or the best type of government. Many uh, take for granted that democracy is a justifiable form of government but it is just one form of government among many others and other forms of government have been functional. So as philosophers argue on all subjects, uh, we need to question whether it, democracy is actually a superior form of governance. After all, it relies on majority rule. Well, what if the majority is mistaken and actually supports measures that work against our well-being? Uh, let's assume the majority of scientists are right and human-influenced climate change is actually occurring. What if the majority rules to do nothing about it, even as that might harm our children or gr grandchildren? So it seems like there are times when democracy leads to inefficiencies and straight-up bad decisions. We can judge a political system by using the ethical theories we've been studying. Uh, for instance, if a political system tends to promote the well-being of the majority, then utilitarians would endorse it. Deontologists would be concerned with whether human rights are being respected, and they would support a government that does not use people as a means to an end. Um, for instance, they would not endorse a political system that passed laws that used people as merely means to an end. They also would want to protect that which is in the interests of rational human beings. For instance, some degree of liberty, fairness, a system that ensures citizens' basic needs are met, and so on. We might also judge a system on how efficient it is. Um, the U.S. government is actually quite inefficient. The president can veto a law that is desperately needed unless a supermajority vote is reached in both houses, which is asking quite a bit. Um, we've also seen that the government can become totally gridlocked, as we saw in the long government shutdown in 2013. So our inefficiencies are actually applauded and thought of as strengths as they stem from checks and balances that help ensure one branch of government doesn't wield much more power than the others. But if there's a major issue to address, such as, well, immigration reform, uh, which both parties agree we need, uh, we can't get anything done expediently if they don't agree with each other on what should be done. So people who support democracy as a system of government tend to lean towards a deontological approach. After all, supporters of democracy think that giving each person a vote and some degree of influence on the government ensures that certain fundamental rights are respected, regardless of the consequences. Such rights uh, include the right to vote uh, and the right to free sweet speech. A democracy is also justified on the basis of respecting people's freedom and autonomy. People freely pass laws and elect people to represent them. Uh, they then submit to the resulting laws and consequences of that. So philosophers John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, argued that uh, citizens in a democracy freely enter into an agreement to abide by that society's laws. Even when they're in the minority and the laws don't reflect their will, they must abide by them because of this agreement that they've entered into. Um, the argument is that the alternative is, in philosopher um, Thomas Hobbes' words, a state of nature, where people are unorganized and untrustworthy. And a state of nature is a world where uh, might makes right. So if you want something that someone else lays claim to and you think you can take it without repercussions, in a state of nature there's nothing stopping you from taking it. But if you have a government... Uh, laws and a branch of government that can ensure those laws are upheld, um, executive and judicial branches, uh, you don't have to be in such a state of nature. You can feel secure that your rights and property will be protected. In a democracy, um, you also participated in the passing of those laws. And you can lead or support movements to change existing laws. Uh, you have entered into a social contract that gives you peace of mind. As such, you have an obligation to uphold the laws that are passed, whether you agree with them or not. Um, your political obligation 
um, is then to do what you have freely agreed to do, which is to vote and respect the outcome of that vote. So what about people born into the democratic state? Like I'm, I imagine most of you have been born here and born into this state. Uh, I was, um, and I was never asked to consent to the rules of democracy or our constitution. I was born a citizen and expected to support democracy and our constitution from day one. How can I be expected to submit to the U.S. rules when I never signed such a social contract? So John Locke argues that I provide tacit consent by being in this place at this time. He argues that as long as I stay here, I am consenting to its rules and the authority of the government. And the same goes for us when we travel abroad. Uh, responsible travelers try to learn something about the rules of where they're going, and then they obey them. Uh, if we don't agree with the rules, we shouldn't go there. The argument for tacit consent means that if you know the kind of society you're in, and you aren't forced to be there, unable to leave, then you give tacit consent to the authority of the local government. All this time, your freedom and autonomy is preserved since you always have the option of leaving. That's how the argument goes. Some things to question. Are people sufficiently informed such that they are making a conscious agreement and entering into a contract knowingly and willingly? A lot of people don't take the time to study and think critically about our government. Uh, have they really entered into a tacit agreement? Uh, you'll often see, you know, television personalities go out and, and survey people on the street, and a lot of them don't even know the three branches of government. Okay? So, to what degree have they really entered into a tacit agreement consciously? Also, people who understand the laws and the system of government may not be able to realistically leave. Um, it costs money to leave, and it might involve breaking important emotional bonds that you have with your family and friends. You also need a country that accepts you. Uh, having an option to actually leave might be a sign of privilege. Those who are just making ends meet uh, may not be able to actually leave. Um, just consider all the people stuck in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Many couldn't realistically leave their city for a safe place when the hurricane was arriving. How much harder would it be to leave the whole country? And even those who stay willingly may not tacitly agree to the government institutions and laws. For instance, they may agree to stay for a variety of reasons, including emotional attachment to a place or family, and they may agree that they won't be surprised if they are punished for breaking a law, but that doesn't mean they've agreed that the laws are justified. In other words, they remain in the country but haven't agreed that the laws are justified. They just agree that the laws exist. This might be the case for anyone in the country who feels disenfranchised. Another thing to question is whether or not uh, majority rule by voting is justifiable. Uh, when someone votes and is in the minority, they have expressed their autonomy by voting, but it's not accurate to say they express their autonomy when they have to abide by something they disagree with, especially when it would be flippant to suggest that they could simply leave the country or state where that law is enacted. So majority rule might be justified on the basis that the majority outnumbers the minority and so can coerce the minority, uh, but going with the majority vote avoids all the pain and suffering that would result if the majority had to do so physically. But that means that the minority's autonomy is given up after the vote and they are essentially coerced. Where we started by justifying democracy on deontological grounds, as it protects autonomy and freedom, uh, when we consider all this, we're left justifying it on utilitarian grounds as it's ultimately justified on the basis of preventing the suffering that would occur if the majority fought the minority to enact its will. Now, what I've gone over so far is a review of our textbook reading this week. Um, what I'm not covering is a section on Plato and his criticism of democracy and, um, and his view of the world, as well as B.F. Skinner's utopian non-democratic society.
So please email me if you have any questions about those sections as you read them um, or about anything that I just covered. But I wanted to give you something that goes beyond what our, our book talks about. So alongside discussing democracy, we can also debate economic systems and rules. What I'd like to do now is discuss two economic theories of social justice. The first is libertarianism, and its most famous philosophical proponent is Robert Nozick. Uh, as far as current political figures, Rand Paul is a, is a libertarian. And he has run for president a couple times um, under the Republican ticket. Uh, the second uh, economic theory we're going to talk about is um, democratic socialism in the spirit of Bernie Sanders' campaign. And that's made famous by the philosopher John Rawls. So we'll start with uh, Robert Nozick. And he wrote a paper called Justice and Entitlement, where he deals with the concept of distributive justice. He addresses the issue that it can be difficult to make sure everyone gets a fair distribution of resources. After all, in the U.S., we don't have a central authority that decides who gets different resources. Such a system is more akin to communism, whose government owns the means of production and distributes goods and services equally to all people. But in a capitalist country, different individuals control different resources, and the distribution of these resources is based off the individual decisions and voluntary exchanges between people. Um, so it amounts to an unequal distribution. We have different classes of people and everyone makes different amounts of money and so on. So the question is, is the unequal distribution of resources in the U.S. and other capitalist countries justified? So who is entitled to what resources? One important thing to address is the original acquisition of holdings, or you can think of holdings as property. That is, how does someone come to acquire something that wasn't yet acquired? Uh, for example, if you came across unowned property, uh, how can you come to own it fairly? Another important thing to address is how property is transferred. How can we fairly transfer goods from one person to another? In this case, I sell you something and I want to make sure that that sale or transfer of property is fair. So Nozick argues that we can say a system is just if everyone is entitled to the holdings they possess under distribution. That is, if you come across unowned land you are entitled to it if you acquire it justly. You are also entitled to an object your friend sells you if you acquire it justly. So as you can see, justice and entitlement are at the heart of the issue. But what does it mean to say you've acquired your holdings or your property justly? For Nozick, it means that uh, the holdings were not stolen, did not involve fraud, did not involve enslaving another, and that the competition for these holdings was open to everyone. Essentially, he thinks you're entitled to your holdings or your property if, you are, if you, they are acquired openly and fairly. So it's clear then that Nozick's entitlement theory takes history into account. He says, and this is a quote, uh, whether a distribution is just depends upon how it came about. He is arguing against what we would call a current time slice approach, which means that um, we shouldn't look at how holdings came about, but where they are at now. This is against his theory. Um, people who take a current time slice approach don't care how things came about. They just care about how the, the current or future distributions will affect pleasure and pain in the world. For instance, I'll give you an example. For a utilitarian, if I acquire $6 fairly and three other people acquire $2 fairly, we collectively have $12. The utilitarian, not caring about how we acquired our money, would argue that the money should be spread out so everybody has $3. That would maximize well-being for everyone. 
I would be negatively affected, but three people would be positively affected. So a utilitarian would argue for that. So this demonstrates how a current time slice approach works. It doesn't matter how you acquired the money. It matters that you have the money and that it's distributed so it achieves the greater good. And Nozick disagrees. Um, he argues that so long as I acquired my $6 fairly, I am entitled to it and it would be unjust to force me to spread out that money. In other words, the history of how I acquired my property matters. So Nozick's most famous example is known as the Wilt Chamberlain example. Um, Wilt Chamberlain is one of the greatest basketball players in history, and Nozick asks us to consider this example. So Chamberlain signs the following deal with the team. In each home game, 25 cents from the price of each ticket of admission goes to him. The season starts and people cheerfully attend the games, and each time they buy a ticket, they drop 25 cents of their money uh, into a special box with Chamberlain's name on it. So during season one, let's say a million people attend the game, and Chamberlain ends up with $250,000. Now that's not a lot of money nowadays, um, but when Nozick was writing that, it, it was, and he asked us to um, just for the sake of this, this thought experiment, assume that it's a huge sum of money and more money than anyone else has. So in other words, it makes Chamberlain the richest person in the world. So the question is, is he entitled to this income? Is the distribution of income unjust? And if so, why? Now everyone who dropped a quarter in Chamberlain's bucket did so willingly and consciously. So Nozick writes, and this is a quote, each of these persons chose to give 25 cents of their money to Chamberlain. They could have spent it on the movies, or on candy bars, or on a magazine, or the monthly review, but they all, at least one million of them, converged on giving it to Wilt Chamberlain in exchange for watching him play basketball. So Nozick argues that it seems to, to be just as it was done fairly and consciously. So long as that is the case, nobody should be able to redistribute, redistribute those holdings. No one should be able to redistribute Chamberlain's money. So where does this lead us? Nozick supports the theory of libertarianism. He argues that we should allow the free transfer of holdings. We should only punish those um, and take away the property of those who acquired it unfairly. Now this means that the government acts unjustly when they tax a person's fairly acquired holdings. Uh, taxing Wilt Chamberlain's $250,000 would be taking away money that he freely and fairly acquired. And Nozick argues that we should not interfere with this fair distribution. So this is Nozick's argument against taxation. Incidentally, Libertarians favor a social system where the government plays a very limited role. Uh, they basically are only taxed um, with ensuring that the distribution of property is done fairly and justly. That's their purpose, the government's purpose. Some problems with this theory include the fact that looking at history, it's hard to be sure that our holdings were acquired fairly. Uh, the Wilt Chamberlain example is, is very simple, but it doesn't reflect real life. For instance, the land we are sitting on right now used to belong to Native Americans. That transfer of holdings doesn't appear to be fair if you look at the history. So this begs the question, how far back into history should we look to determine if our property was fairly acquired? Also, a lot of wealth in the United States has been acquired through a long history of slavery and unfair segregation laws and the inability to vote continued to set African Americans back even after slavery was illegal. Do we need to make reparations for African Americans to right this wrong? That would involve taxing people and redistributing wealth. In a nutshell, the social landscape is very complex 
and it's hard to tell what transfer of holdings were historically fair and just. Still, Nozick offers us a powerful account of economic justice that we must grapple with. Next, we'll look at um, John Rawls, and John Rawls offers another perspective. He argues that uh, to come up with the concept of justice, we must backtrack to what he calls an original agreement. And this includes, and I quote, uh, the principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests would accept in, in an initial position of equality as defining the fundamental terms of their association. These principles are to regulate all further agreements. They specify the kinds of social cooperation that can be entered into and the forms of government that can be established. This way of regarding the principles of justice I shall call justice as fairness. So, if we can decide what principles should govern free and rational people, these principles will help us make legislative, executive, and judicial de decisions. So Rawls argues that a single individual can't determine what these principles are. Rather, a group must decide what these principles are together. Otherwise, a person will just decide what's best for him or her, not the overall society. So Rawls also argues that we must do this abstractly since we are determining what these principles are theoretically. So our theoretical original position will be as a group behind what he calls a veil of ignorance. So what is the veil of ignorance? It's a thought experiment that doesn't give us a real situation, but lets us imagine a situation and discover what we think we ought to do. What we would do in this imaginary scenario helps us develop governing concepts in our consciousness. So in the veil of ignorance, thought experiment, we are supposed to imagine that a group of people have collected and no one knows their place in history, their class position or social status, their fortune, their natural abilities, their intelligence, strength, and so on. In other words, we don't know what kind of person we are. I might be male or female, gay or straight, rich or poor, white or Hispanic or Indian or Native American or Chinese and so on, strong or weak, mentally disabled or intellectually gifted, etc. A group of people who don't know who they are gather together to determine what the principles of justice are. So Rawls writes, since all are similarly situated and no one is able to design principles to favor his particular condition, the principles of justice are the result of a fair agreement or bargain. In other words, we aren't just going to figure out uh, what would benefit us in, in our current particular lives since we don't know what kind of lives we'll have. We must create a world that we would all want to live in regardless of who we are born as. So under the veil of ignorance, uh, what are some of the agreements you would definitely not want to make? Rawls notes that you wouldn't want to enact anything that wasn't fair because whoever we end up being, we want to be treated fairly. So Rawls thinks we will agree on uh, rights of basic liberty. He says, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with the similar liberty of others. So in other words, you wouldn't want an agreement that would allow for, say, racial segregation, persecution of the mentally handicapped, a system that favored people with physical power, and so on. This could work against you depending on who you were born as. So ultimately, this rules out discriminatory laws, um, as we wouldn't want to risk being someone discriminated against. He argues that we will also agree on certain social and economic rights. He says, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and B, attached to positions and offices open to all. He was therefore opposed to communism. Um, you wouldn't want, after all, an agreement that punished people who earned a certain income, uh, like someone who follows all of Nozick's rules and fairly acquires property. 
you wouldn't want to punish that person. So you would want to encourage hard work because that means that you, despite your place in society or social status or your strengths or weaknesses, could work hard and improve your situation. Rawls argues then that so long as um, positions and offices are open to all, it's possible for you to work your way up the economic ladder and get paid and rewarded accordingly. Okay? So you wouldn't want to put yourself at a disadvantage if you were born with certain advantages, if that makes sense. Okay? So how can these positions in the economy be open to all? It must mean that everyone has equal access to education and resources. Um, the school system to, in the U.S. today doesn't adhere to this second principle. Uh, if you're born in a position of wealth, uh, you're born to a wealthy family, you have access to impressive private schools. If you don't, uh, you do not have such access. So thus, uh, the wealthy are given advantage to become a manager, owner, um, a doctor, or some other high-paying um, position or influential position, whereas people born poor are not. Um, the, these positions of power are not closed off to people who grow up without privilege, but the road to getting there is incredibly tough. So in order to provide equal education for all, we're going to need a tax system. Um, against Nozick, uh, we will need to tax people, even when their acquisition of holdings is just and fair. Uh, further, Rawls argues that we will need a, t a fair tax system. And what would such a fair tax system look like? Well, it's got to be one that benefits everybody. So one thing we would want to make sure that we didn't do is, is put ourselves in a terrible financial position because of taxes. If we work hard and we earn a lot and move up the economic ladder, we would want to be able to hold on to a lot of what we've acquired. If we're born into poverty, we don't want to be overly burdened by taxes. So that is in the veil of ignorance. Um, we also wouldn't want to create disadvantages for ourselves if we are born in a good position or in a bad position. So this rules out a flat tax where every dollar is taxed the same. While this may seem fair on the surface, it puts the poor at a serious disadvantage and we might come out of this veil of ignorance as a poor person. So being taxed on the few dollars we had could be devastating. If we had a graduated income tax, some people call it a progressive income tax, you pay more tax on your dollar as you make more. Uh, but we would still be, people who make more would still be wealthy, they're not overly taxed, and they'd be pretty comfortable but if you came out extremely poor, you wouldn't have to pay a tax, or you'd pay a very small, small tax. And this would help you rise out of your poverty. So for Rawls, a graduated income tax would be ideal. So this is a very basic overview of uh, Nozick and Rawls, but this gives you a flavor of um, what economic justice might look like. Okay. Okay, so this ends my lecture for the week, um, but think about what other laws you might create if you were in this veil of ignorance with other people. If you had to reach an agreement with a group of people, all looking out for your own best interests, uh, but not knowing what kind of life would, you would have, what kind of agreements would you make? So let me know if you have any questions about my lecture, and um, either on the sections uh, reading for the week, um, or on these two theories of economic justice. Thanks a lot.